again. It is now April of 2017. And it was all oh, about a year and a half ago, I was speaking with uh, this man, well-known treasure hunter. And he told me that he was the best treasure dowser in the world, that there was absolutely nobody else that was better than him. I said, okay, all right, uh-huh. So I asked him, I said, well, what have you found? Dowsing. He goes, well, I found Montezuma's treasure. I said, oh, you did? Where at? He goes, Utah. Okay. Okay. Asked me, have you ever read any books about Montezuma or Montezuma's treasure? He goes, oh, no, no, no. Well, how'd you know it was Montezuma's treasure? Well, evidently, the dowsing had indicated to him that that was Montezuma's treasure. Okay. All right. So, well, you have any idea how the treasure got out of uh, Mexico City, it being already besieged by the Spaniards? No, he hadn't given that much thought. Well, how about the logistics of getting 2,000 miles north across some of the deepest gorges and, uh, uh, and canyons, uh, the highest mountains in the continent, some of the roughest terrain on the planet Earth? Give that much thought? Was it horses, pack mules? Well, they didn't have any of that. So, no, it must have been manpower then, right? Mm -hmm. Men, men carried that gold. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to establish Montezuma's treasure for you. I'm going to show it to you. And then we're going to follow Montezuma's treasure through the book that all the treasure hunters use that are looking for Montezuma's treasure. We're going to follow it through the book to the end. And then I'll show you and tell you where Montezuma's treasure ended up. Hope you enjoy this. Thank you. This is my copy of uh, the Bernal Diaz, uh, The Conquest of New Spain. It's a Penguin classic. I love, I've got dozens of these Penguin classics. And when I purchased this, I had, there were a couple of others and I looked through them and I liked this one the best. It had a couple of maps in it that I thought were, 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 were beneficial. And Bernal Diaz was born in 1492 and he died in the um, eight in, in the 1580s, so he was uh, like 89 when he died, and he was 76 when he started having his memoirs recorded. And it's obvious that what happened to him, there would be no way for him to forget it. But I'm sure it was hard for him to recollect some of the minor details. But he did an excellent, excellent job. And I'm picking up on page 218, and the first part of the book generally describes uh, some of the towns, some of the people, some of the battles, the skirmishes, the hardships that the uh, Spaniards, the conquistadors suffered trying to get to Mexico City because Montezuma was trying to kill them every step of the way. He was trying to just put them out. And on the day that they met Montezuma, after they had the initial gathering and the initial, hello, how are you doing? I'm so-and-so, yeah, nine, nine, nine. So, uh, Cortez and his men were led to these large houses or, or small palaces, perhaps, we can say. And here we're going to pick up. They, uh, Montezuma's stewards, led us to our quarters, which were in some large houses capable of accommodating all of us and had formerly belonged to the great Montezuma's father, who was called Ashiakto. Here, Montezuma now kept the great shrines of his gods and a secret chamber containing gold bars and jewels. This was the treasure he had inherited from his father, which he never touched. Now we're skipping over to page 241, and the reason there's such a big uh, jump there is because Bernal Diaz starts embellishing about the people, the marketplaces, all of the goods, the food, animals, uh, etc., etc., um, idols, um, religious rituals, on and on and on. So we're going to pick up here. He, he, now we're, we're, we're back into the room that night where they were going to spend uh, the first night uh, under Montezuma's care. It being our habit to examine and inquire into everything, when we were all assembled in our lodging and considering which was the best place for an altar, two of our men called attention to some marks on one of the walls which showed that there had once been a door, though it had been well plastered up and painted. Now as we heard that Montezuma kept his father's treasure in this building, we immediately suspected that it must be in this room. Okay. Now as we had heard that Montezuma, well, 
who leaked the information. It could have only been someone familiar with Montezuma in his court or perhaps one of the uh, Tlaxcalans who were allied with the conquistadors. That's the only way that they would have heard that. Uh, in other words, how, how are the Spanish going to even know? How are they going to know? Picking up right here. Yanez made the suggestion to Juan Velasquez de Leon and next page 242 Francisco de Lugo and they mentioned the matter to Cortez. So the door was secretly opened and Cortez went in first with certain captains. When they saw the quantity of golden objects, jewels and plates and ingots which lay in that chamber, they were quite transported or taken aback, taken away. They did not know what to think of such riches. The news soon spread to the other captains and soldiers and very secretly we all went in to see. The sight of all that wealth dumbfounded me. Being only a youth at the time, and never having seen such riches before, I felt certain that there could not be a store like it in the whole world. We unanimously decided that we could not think of touching any of it, and that the stones should immediately be replaced in the doorway, sh uh, which should be blocked again and cemented just as we had found it. We resolved also that not a word should be said about this until times changed for fear Montezuma might hear of our discovery. Now at this time, Bernal Diaz is like 28 years old, okay, 28. Now hang on to your shirt because Montezuma's treasure is fixing to take a ride. Picking up on page 257, now this is only a couple of days after uh, the, um, uh, the Mexicans, I mean, excuse me, the Spanish have gone into, to, uh, uh, um, in, into Mexico City and they had placed Montezuma under house arrest pretty much until, uh, until they could figure things out. So uh, it's not like there's a, several weeks or months between some of these passages. They clip along pretty good. It's just a matter of days when all this is taking place. When Cacomatzin, lord of the largest and most important uh, city in New Spain other than uh, Mexico, heard that his uncle Montezuma had been imprisoned, and, and then he also got the news uh, that we had opened the chamber where the great treasure of his grandfather was kept, but had so far left it untouched. He decided that before we actually took possession of it, something must be done. So by the time the, the conquistadors had gotten into Mexico uh, City, it was just a, a, uh, like three or four days before they had Montezuma under arrest. So this is like within a week or so of all this happening. So this kind of clips along pretty good. This is Montezuma talking to Cortez and his captains. This is a, a coming from page 271. Take this gold which has been collected. Only haste prevents there being more. What I myself have got ready for the emperor is the whole of the treasure I received from my father, which is under your hand in your own apartments. I know very well that as soon as you came here, you opened the door and inspected it all, and then sealed it up again as it was before. When you send it to him, tell him in your papers and letters, this is sent by your loyal vassal Montezuma. I will also give you uh, some very precious stones to be sent to him in my name. They are talismans, that word means talismans, and must not be given to anyone else but your great prince, for each one of them is worth two loads of gold. Two loads of gold. So hang on, we're gonna, we're gonna find out and see where all this gold goes. This is at the bottom of 271. After a further exchange of compliments, Montezuma dispatched his stewards to hand over all the gold and treasure in the sealed chamber. It took us three days to examine it and remove all the embellishments uh, with which it was decorated. It had a li little ta uh, 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 little chains and little uh, little three-dimensional statues and stuff and, and a lot of feathers. There was a lot of feathers supposedly on some of this stuff. And to help us take it to pieces, Montezuma sent us silversmiths from this happy village. There was so much of it that after it was broken up, it made three heaps of gold weighing over 600,000 pesos. 
in all, not counting the silver and many other valuables or the ingots and slabs of gold. This one don't even, don't even uh, count the heavy stuff or the grains of gold from the mines, which hadn't been processed yet. With the help of the Indian goldsmiths from this happy village, we began to melt this down into broad bars, a little more than two inches across, and no sooner was this done than they brought another present, one which Montezuma had promised to give for himself. Now, so the, uh, the conquistadors, the Spanish are melting down the bars, and when you melt gold, as soon as that gold bubbles and, and, and boils and it turns to vapor like just a two or three degree, a degree centigrade uh, uh, above the melting point, you have to be very, very careful and know what you're doing. Otherwise, poof, the gold just disappears right in front of your very eyes. I know. I know this to be a fact. <laughs> they brought another present the one which Montezuma had promised to give for himself. It was marvelous to behold so much gold and the richness of the jewels he gave us. Some of the talismans were so fine that among the chieftains they were worth a vast quantity of gold. Encrusted with pearls. And here it is, you know, I will mention that the, the plumes and feathers. I'm going to scroll down here. For weighing all these bars of gold and silver and the jewels which were not broken up, we had neither weights nor scales. Cortez and these same officers of the king's treasury thought it would be proper, therefore, to make some iron weights, some as heavy as 25 pounds. Well, where in the world did they get the iron is what my question was. Did they melt down a cannon? How did they make them? What did they use to, to get 25 pounds? Just guesstimate it? Or, or how, how, I'm just asking. I'm just asking. But remember officers of the king's treasury because we're going to talk more about them a little bit later on. Scroll on down here. After the weight was taken, the king's officers said that the bars and grains and ingots and jewels altogether came to more than 600,000 pesos and this did not include the silver and the many other jewels which were not yet valued. Some soldiers said there was more. All that remained to be done was to take out the royal fifth and then give each captain, next page, 273, and soldier his share, preserving their shares for those who had remained at Villarica, which was close to the coast. They left 70 people there to begin the colony, the colonization. It seems, however, that Cortez attempted to postpone the division until we had more gold, good weights, and a proper account of the total. But most of us said that the division must be made at once. <laughs> this is cute. This is cute. Check this out. For we had noticed that when the pieces taken from Montezuma's treasure were broken up, there had been much more gold in the piles, and that a third of it was now <laughs> missing having been taken away and hidden for the benefit of Cortez, the captains, and the uh, uh, Mercedarian friar. We also saw that the gold was still diminishing. <laughs> Imagine that! Imagine that! After a good deal of argument, what was left, uh, uh, what was, left was weighed out. It amounted to 600,000 pesos without the jewels and bars. And and it was agreed that the division should be made the next day. And here we're talking about how it was all going to be divided up. I'm going to scroll on down here to the bottom. At that time, many of the captains ordered very large golden chains. Many of the captains ordered very large golden chains to be made by Montezuma's goldsmiths from the Happy Village. What is a large chain? And Cortez also ordered various jewels and a great service of plate. Some soldiers, too, had laid hands on so much that ingots marked and unmarked and a great variety of jewels were already in public circulation. <laughs> they were already spending the money in, in, in downtown Mexico City. And then it's talking about how some of the soldiers were, they weren't happy with their share of the gold and that 
uh, uh, there's a big squabble going on now. Okay, so here. Now, all men covet gold. And the more we have, the more we want. And several recognizable pieces were missing from the heaps. In other words, they, they had seen it enough times to uh, recognize the pieces. And here's uh, Velasquez de Leon um, had in, also employed the goldsmith to make him some large gold chains and pieces of plate for his table. And uh, uh, Gonzalo, one of the treasurers, privately requested him to deliver this gold to him since it had not been paid the royal fifth and was known to belong to the treasure Montezuma had given him. Okay, then he refused. And, and uh, because uh, he said that uh, this was given him before Cortez had given him before the bars were cast. So, the treasury officer demanded all the gold that had not been paid the royal fifth. So, hang on, gold's going to take a ride. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna track it all down for you. We're going to track it all down and you're going to see what happened to, uh, to Montezuma's treasure. Now, I'm picking back up on page 275, where, as I was explaining, when they were divvying up the, uh, the gold, there was a dispute between a couple of Cortez's captains. And Cortez threw one of his favorite captains in the brig, uh, uh, Velasquez. And Velasquez liked him. Velasquez uh, uh, was liked by Montezuma. And so Montezuma asked why had he imprisoned Velasquez. So Cortez just laughs it off and said, well, that he had become a bit touched. He became touched with gold fever, by which he meant out, meant out of his senses. And because not having received much gold, he wanted to go to Montezuma's towns and cities and demand it of the chieftains. Let's go to the next page. And for this reason, and he prevented him from killing anyone, he had been put in prison. Well, shoot, when Montezuma heard that, he goes like, what are you talking about? Montezuma begged Cortez to release Velasquez and send him to look for more gold. Well, that's a brilliant idea. Why not just send him out to go get with, with some of my guys and go get some more gold? This guy's ambitious. He's going places. What a brilliant young man. So Cortez says, uh, you can see it here, goes, well, okay, on your demands, I will, I will release him, but he's going to be banished. So he went to the town of Cholula with some of Montezuma's messengers to demand gold. Velasquez returned six days later, bringing more gold with him. <laughs> oh, my goodness, what a great idea. And this just must be a couple of days later. All this happens in, a, in, in just a, a, a small amount of time. One day Montezuma said to Cortez, See si Malinche, see si Malinche, how much I love you. I would like to give you one of my daughters. Malinche. We're going to talk a little bit more about Malinche later. This picks up on page 278. Their gods also observed that they had seen us break up the gold that was once kept in their honor and forge it into ingots. So they're, they're just forging away. I guess night and day, night and day. All right, and here we see where Cortez hurried to the palace where Montezuma was, taking with him this, this captain and, and also Doña Marina and Geronimo Aguilar. Okay, so uh, Doña Marina and Ger uh, Geronimo, they were the translators. They were the translators, that's all. They were translators. I'll pay great respect to the great Montezuma who addressed them in these words. Uh, uh, my Lord Malinche, my Lord Malinche, he addressed them, but it's actually Cortez, Cortez, my Lord Malinche. Keep that in mind. And Narvaez, he was sent by the king to imprison uh, Cortez uh, for his crimes. And Cortez was not going to have anything of it. Uh, he did not want uh, the Indians to see that the Spanish were, were already squabbling with each other. And Montezuma had already sent to Narvaez when he arrived at the coast, sent him a bunch of gold and presents and such. Bribes and presents of gold soon produced dissension among Narvaez's followers. But the captain himself obstinately pers uh, persisted in his hostility to Cortez. A few of his men deserted to Sandoval. They, Sandoval was the uh, captain that uh, that Cortez had sent to to uh, uh, to arrest Nar uh, Narvaez, uh, who then moved to Sampola, 
where he extracted from the fat chief all the treasure that Cortez had left in his charge. So what has happened is Cortez had to actually leave uh, Mexico City and go to handle this this little side tangent here uh, to uh, to take care of. Now right here we have the Mexican prince who was playing a double game, playing both sides, sent gold and supplies to Narvaez. Okay, so he wanted he wanted Narvaez to revolt against uh, Cortez. Page 297. By the time these dispositions had been made, it was already night, and the gold could be divided among those who were to carry it. Cortez ordered Guzman, his steward, and other soldiers who were his servants to have all the gold and jewels and silver brought out. Now, this is where he's already back in, uh, in Mexico City, and they are under siege. The, uh, the, uh, the Mexicans are just raising conniption fits and starting to riot against them. So they're going to try to force their way out. Now, they got all this gold. Well, what are they going to do with it? How are they going to get it out of Mexico City? He, Cortez, gave them seven wounded and lame horses and one mare and more than 80 of our Tlaxcalan allies. And they loaded, get this, they loaded men and animals alike with as much as each could carry. It was, as I have said, made up into very broad ingots, but much gold still remained piled up in the hall. Then Cortez called his secretary and others who were there uh, of the king's notaries and said, Bear witness for me that I can do no more with this gold. Here in this hall we have more than 700,000 pesos worth. So I don't know if you've been following these numbers, but this is after they've loaded up eight, what, eight horses and, and, and 80 men, and now they still have the same amount as what they started with. <laughs> So Cortez uh, uh, says, I now give it over to any soldiers who, take, who, who care to take it. Otherwise, we shall lose it to these dogs. On hearing this, many of Narvaez's men and some of ours loaded themselves with it. So now we're following it. Now, now we've still got piles and we've got all these guys and there's all, all this gold still piled up. We're following Montezuma's treasure. Malinche, Malinche. If you go online today and you Google Malinche, pops up Donya Marina. Okay. Well, funny thing, nowhere in these books is Donya Marina referred to as Malinche. Nowhere. Well, where do the experts, the, the Montezuma experts, where do they get that from? And where do all the people all over the world get that Malinche was Doña Marina? It ain't there. But if they bothered to read out of five letters of Cortez, now I'm not using this book. I've used it before in other presentations. I've just got one little passage that I want to read in here. And this is taken from page 382. <coughs> Talking about Doña Marina. Her Indian name, her native Indian name, had been Malinaw. As a Christian, she was baptized Marina. This was corrupted to Malinche, and it was as Captain Malinche that all the natives were wont to salute Cortez. How did the experts miss that? How has the world missed? Am I the only person that made it 380 pages into this book? There's one expert on Montezuma's treasure. Got a video out, does lectures. And he states, he puts a caption up. Naturally, he gets Malinche as Doña Marina. He, he bums that out real bad. And then he quotes from Bernal Diaz saying that Montezuma had a gold plate larger than a cartwheel. And he had a, uh, another silver plate that was even larger than that. Well, I have a question for you, sir. Where do you see that in this book? You must have gotten it online because that quote is not in this book anywhere. It's not. And, of course, there's no reference that Doña Marina was ever, ever, ever called Malinche. So how did the experts miss that? How did the world miss that? Am I the only one? I don't know. But I'm going to explain to you here in a few minutes how the experts missed it. At this point, Cortez and his men are besieged 
in uh, Mexico City, and they're trying like heck to get out. They they did get out, uh, uh, but uh, after much hardship. But we're going to look and see what actually happened. Now, picking up on uh, page 299. And the horses with the gold and the Talaskans reached safety also. So, so we see here that the gold made it out before the Spanish, uh, before the conquistadors did. They they got out before the absolute mayhem and all the other uh, uh, um, thousands and thousands of Mexican warriors got there. They they got the gold out. On page on three three hundred one of Navarre's company. The majority fell at the bridge, weighed down with gold. Okay, so there's a large portion of it just went down at the bridge. Page 306. And if we come to consider it, none of us had much luck with his share of the gold we received. For if more of Navarra's men and uh, than those of Cortez fell at the bridges, it was because they were so weighed down by the stuff that they could neither run nor swim. Now, granted, they've got on armor as well. So they're weighted down with the gold and they just sunk to the bottom of the, uh, of, of the lake with their gold. Page 307. Now, this is after Cortez gets to uh, the next town. I think it was Talascan. Uh, uh, Cortez gave all the chieftains golden jewels and precious stones. He's giving it away. And every soldier had brought away all that he could. Some of us gave presents out of what we had to the Indians we knew. So they're sharing everything. They're sharing everything. How they rejoiced, how happy they seemed when they saw that uh, Doña Luisa and, and uh, Doña Marina were safe. Page 308, the Spaniards spent 22 days at Tlaxcala, where a further disaster had befallen them. The gold that had been stored there, which was the Villa Rica settlers' share of the booty, had been recaptured by the Mexicans, who had killed the three settlers, and they, and they fetched it away. They took it back to Mexico, but that's not very much. If, if you've only got three guys carrying the gold, that's not that much gold. But it's a disaster. They, you know, we're, we, we are concentrating on the gold. So now, whatever three people could carry is now has has now been stolen by the Mexicans. This is picking up on page three ten. At this point, uh, uh, Kakamatsen, uh, the nephew of Montezuma, has been slain, and Watamak is now firmly in charge and sitting on the throne in Mexico City, what they call Mexico here. And uh, Cortez and his men are in some of the outlying cities that were not allied with the Mexicans. And he's regrouping, he's rethinking, he's, he's, he's laying his strategy. And, he, and here's referring back again to the Villarica settlers and their, go, and their load of gold had been stolen, had been stolen by the Mexicans, some, probably some spies or something. A preliminary request for the return of the gold was refused. Well, what the heck did you think? Oh, we stole the gold from you. Now you stole it back from us. Uh, we want it back. Well, heck no, no. It's mine, mine, mine now. Who? <laughs> My goodness. Uh, they did not, however, find the missing gold which had been transported to Mexico. Mexico City, actually. We're going to scroll down here. We're going to see. Accusations were broadcast, especially by Narvaez's men, and references were made to Cortez's inaccurate estimates of the gold and treasure they had won in Mexico, Mexico City. Now the poor soldier, who had done all the hard work and was covered with wounds, had not only lost his share of the gold, but was, get this, robbed of the woman he had chosen. He had kidnapped. He had kidnapped for himself. A further quarrel broke out on the subject of the gold saved on the flight from Mexico. At the last moment, Cortez offered the ingots that could, that could not be taken by horses or porters to anyone who cared to carry them away. 
a number of soldiers had loaded themselves with this treasure and some had paid for it with their lives. But as nearly all the captains and the king's officials themselves had secret hordes, the proclamation was largely ignored. Okay, so everybody had been stashing gold all over the place. I mean, where? Underneath a brick? Underneath a block? Who? Oh, you got me. You got me. And here we're talking about uh, uh, horses from, uh, uh, from Jamaica. In addition, he sent a ship to Jamaica to buy horses. All this was paid for with the gold ingots, which had been kept out of sight. Private hoard. Yes, yes, yes. There's no telling how much private gold Cortez had. Next, we're going to look at page 314. On the other hand, he knew that 40 Spaniards and about 200 Tlaxcalans had been killed in their city during our retreat from Mexico, and many loads of gold and other spoil belonging to them had been stolen. He asked the messengers, therefore, to request of their lord and the other chieftains and captains of Texcoco to return the gold and cloth, though uh, for the death of the Spaniards, there was no remedy that he would not uh, ask for one. Okay, that is uh, Watamak. Watamak is saying this. Now this is picking up on page 394, Siege of Mexico City. Now, Cortes had changed his stratagem to conquer uh, uh, Watamak and his army that were living out on the island in the middle of Lake Texcoco. What Cortes decided to do was send his armies, send his men around the north and around the south and seal off the causeways. And that's exactly what he did. He sealed off the causeways and then he destroyed the freshwater aqueduct that was coming in from the mountains that were just to the west. They had a huge aqueduct there. One of the first things he did was when he got there uh, and, and took over the town that was just on the west side of Tenochtitlan, Mexico City, he, he destroyed that aqueduct and he, he cut off the access to the causeways so that they had to, trans, uh, had to transport all the food and such and water, everything was transferred to the main, the main city uh, by canoes. And there was just too many people living there and so he, to, his, his idea was to starve them out, thirst them out, and that's what he did. And Watamak was uh, sitting firmly as the ruler there, and Watamak had, had there were issues. He he was he was now defeated. Plus the fact that at that time, Cortez uh, uh, had allied himself. All the other towns and cities that that Montezuma had just been brutally repressing uh, with this tyrannical nature for uh, you know decades, uh, they they all just sided in with the Spanish. They side in with, with the conquistadors. And so picking up here on page 394, this is talking about Watamak. He had no wish to fight against Malenche and the rest of us. He did not want to fight Cortez. I'm just going to scroll down here to the bottom. This is Watermark talking, or, or actually no, this is a couple of his wise uh, sages that he, is, uh, that he is consulting. All are dead. All the gold and riches of this city have been destroyed, and they have enslaved and branded the faces of all your subjects and vassals at Chalco. So that's what the, the Spaniards did, went through and put brands on the faces of all the subjects of, uh, of Watamak and Montezuma. Do not trust Malenche and his flattering words. It is better that we should all die fighting in this city than see ourselves in the power of those who would enslave us and torture us for gold. We are now looking at page 402. When they, the Mexicans, saw the launches getting in among the houses, 
these people embarked in their 50 canoes in which they had already placed Wadamok's property, gold, and jewels, and all his family and women. Then he himself, Wadamok, embarked and shot out into the lake accompanied by many, uh, many captains. At the same moment, many other canoes came out. So now Wadamok is trying to make it to the mainland, and he's being pursued by the Spanish launches which is uh, just a, a larger boat. Page 406. The soldiers, conquistadors, in the uh, Spanish soldiers, in the launches, came off best and gained most spoil because they were able to go to the houses in certain quarters of the lake where they knew there was cloth, gold, and treasure. So the Spaniards in the boats did pretty doggone good, didn't they? Next we're going to look at page 409. Everyone was agreed that all the gold and silver and jewels in Mexico should be collected together. But this seems to have amounted to very little. For there was a report that Watamock had thrown all the rest into the lake four days before we captured him. And uh, the Tlascans and all the rest of our allies who had taken part in the war, also the conquistadors themselves who went about in the launches, had stolen their share. The officers of the royal treasury publicly proclaimed, therefore, that Watamock had hidden the treasure. And that Cortez was delighted since he would not have to give it up, but could keep it all for himself. For this reason, these officers decided to torture Watamock and his cousin. It wasn't Cortez that tortured Watamock. Right there it is. For all you guys that it, you claim that you have followed and turned over every stone, you have just done your research, and, and uh, you accuse Cortez of torturing Watamock, but how did you miss this? How did you miss this? That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Cortez and some of the rest of us were very much distressed that they should torture a prince like Watamock for greed of gold. It was the king's treasury officers. Thorough inquiries about the treasure had been made and all Watamock's stewards had said that there was no more than the king's officials already had, which amounted to 380,000 gold pesos and had been melted into uh, 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 bars. And the, uh, the royal fifth and Cortez's fifth had already been removed. Now, the treasurer, Julian Alarute, that they had suspected him of opposing the arrest and torture of Watamock and his captains only because he wanted to keep the gold for himself. And this is, this, they're, they're accusing Cortez here uh, uh, of, 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 of being in cahoots with Watamock. Insane. Keeping it for himself. So to avoid making any accusations against Cortez, who could not prevent their action, the action of the officers, they tortured Watamock and Lord of Tacuba by burning their feet with oil and extorted the confession that four days before they had thrown the gold into the lake together with the cannons and muskets that they had captured when they, were, when they had been driven, uh, uh, when they drove the Spaniards out of Mexico, Mexico City. The place Watamock indicated was the palace in which he had lived where there was a large pond from which we fished up a great golden sun like the one that Montezuma had given us and many jewels and articles of small value which belonged to Watamock himself. And then uh, the Lord of Tacuba said that he had some gold things in his house. He lived like 12 miles away and they took him there and he was hoping he was going to die or be killed on the journey. Uh, and, and but he didn't, so they returned empty-handed. 
The truth is that Montezuma's treasure chamber, of which Wadamak took possession at his death, did not contain many jewels or gold ornaments because all the best had been extracted to form the magnificent offering that we had already sent to His Majesty, which was worth twice as much as the fifth deducted for him and Cortez, uh, and Cortez's own fifth as well. This we sent to the Emperor. We captains and soldiers were all somewhat sad when we saw how little gold there was, but they'd been spending it like crazy. They'd been spending it like all over the place. They'd been gambling it away everywhere. After due consideration, they repeated this to Cortez. Page 411. Believing that he would increase our shares, for there was a strong suspicion that he had hidden all the gold away and ordered Watamok to say he had none. Yeah, Watamok's going to say, uh, 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 do what Cortez tells him to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this was some graffiti that Cortez, some, one of the rumors, when Cortez gives us back the gold he's hidden away, everybody was accusing Cortez of making off with the gold. Did he? Who knows? And then Cortez had come to enjoy the benefit and rebelliously taken both the land and the treasure. That was how they, they, uh, they came at him. They accused him of taking both the land and the treasure. Now, page 412. We want to look at this real close. And I must say, this is Bernal Diaz, and I must say that in the end, in compensation for slaves sold by auction, the remaining gold all fell to the king's officials. There it is right there. And now we're going to see how they missed everything. How, how the experts, the experts looking for Montezuma's treasure, we're going, to, we're going to see now how they missed it. Well, now you know what happened to Montezuma's treasure. If you're looking for it, you might as well try Al Capone's vault. And I'm going to challenge anyone the world over. If you can prove me wrong on something, please do. Don't just make some silly comment down there and post it. Cut a video. Call me out. Show your resources. I'd like to see it. I'd like to see it. And I'm going to make a couple of predictions. My first prediction is this. No one will ever, 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years from now, discover a treasure and say, that's Montezuma's treasure. It ain't going to happen. And my second prediction is that all these guys that believe that Montezuma's treasure is in Utah or Arizona or Texas, they're not going to be detoured with the information in this video. They're going to keep right on looking for it. They're going to say, to them, oh, I know it's out there somewhere. They're Harry Hubbard. He's not going to keep, deter me from looking for it. It's been a lifelong dream for him. And one last thing. How did all the experts and the lecturers get so much wrong with their captions and Malinchi and Montezuma's treasure? It's very simple. They never bothered to read the books. <laughs> Thank you.